<laughs> yes, we figured it out. Yay. Okay, so I just wanted to give a little introduction one more time. Um, people are starting to join us live. So thank you everyone for being here. Um, and you can hear me okay, Madeline? Yes. Okay, so to start this off, I'll just reintroduce this little series that I brainstormed over the weekend. And I thought it would be really fun, especially because we're kind of all in lockdown to just connect with other musicians and people who work in the arts. And I thought of Madeline um, as a wonderful person to do a live Q&A with because she is one of my best friends and she's a violinist. And we also went to college together. So I have a few questions for Madeline. And then we also took a few questions that we'll both kind of answer from our audience. And you guys feel free to interact below if you have other questions that come up as we're talking. We'd love to answer those if we can. So my first question to Madeline is, where did you study? What did you study? And what are your career goals? All right, so I did my undergrad at Hope College, where we met, um, and I got a bachelor's in instrumental music education as well as violin performance, so I did a double major, and then I moved to Bowling Green State University in Bowling Green, Ohio, and I received my master's of music in violin performance, which will be official in three weeks, so those, that's where I studied. Um, and while at Bowling Green, I also was a part of the Graduate String Quartet Assistantship, so that was my full-time job at the university. And my career, career goals right now is I would love to run my own studio um, directed towards middle school and high school students. And then I would also, I, I really am passionate about opera music and musical theater, and I would love to be a freelance pit musician for both of those. And then I also really, really enjoy um, chamber music. I think going to Bowling Green and also my undergrad, I developed this passion for it, and um, I would really love to pursue that as a full-time chamber musician, collaborating with other um, different types of instruments even. Doesn't need to be string quartet unnecessarily, but also kind of delving into contemporary music as well. So. Mm -hmm. And I would love to play in an orchestra as well. Um, so basically, you just said you'd like to do like everything. everything. <laughs> <laughs> kind of kind of like what I'm doing, which is like everything. Yeah. I mean, I think we have to be flexible and kind of go where the wind takes us, right? Well, it's also super exciting. Um, yeah. yeah, so for those of you who don't know me, I am a violinist. Madeline and I went to Hope College for undergrad together. We were in, we're a few years, years apart but we were in orchestra together for a while. We were also in a string quartet and we played um, at a few events and lots of weddings together. Um, and then I went ahead, unlike Madeline, I didn't pursue my master's in violin, but I pursued it in arts administration management. And currently kind of like what you were talking about Madeline with your dreams of playing in the pit of operas and Broadway and teaching and doing string quartets and being in orchestras, I'm kind of experiencing a lot of that. I manage um, at a symphony, the Grand Rapids Symphony, but I also still play a ton. I play in the Holland Symphony. I play at local churches. I play many weddings. I have a private studio of students, so I teach. And um, it is super exciting. I love doing the variety of yeah. things within the music industry. And it's so exciting. Every day is new. It's always an adventure. I yeah. agree. It's never boring. It's never boring. <laughs> um, my second question for you, Madeline, is I know that you have quite a few students. Um, and specifically now with the impacts of the virus and being kind of at within a stay home order, how have you coped with the need to teach students in a different way? Um, so right now, all my students are through Black Swamp Fine Arts School in Bowling Green. And it's a, a fabulous organization um, that, you know, really benefits a lot of people in the community. 
And I didn't want to just stop lessons. I think during this time, music is crucial and really important to hang on to. Um, so it was my goal to make it as accessible and as basically as close to the real thing as possible. Um, so I am doing it over Zoom right now, and it's been working pretty well, actually better than I thought. Um, sometimes we have connection issues. Sometimes, you know, it, it, camera angles aren't the best. <laughs> um, but my goal has been to really try and, you know, take this time and see if I can be more in depth with my feedback. Um, so I take notes during the lesson and then I tape them up and send them to the student the next day. Mm -hmm. And I've been trying to incorporate YouTube links. I've been trying to incorporate, you know, fun things, um, technique videos, um, a little bit more in depth than I think I would normally have time for if I'm teaching in person. And I think that's given it a little bit more of a, a rounder education, I guess, in my, you know, than what I would do in person. Um, and I, I hope that I will carry that on in person as well. But so I've kind of done that. And then another thing is I've been trying to um, spend more time on conversation and just mm -hmm. see where the students are at. A lot of them are struggling, um, but they struggle in different ways. So some are really, really are like, I have so much time to practice now and they are really into it. And then um, that's great. We can keep adding more on. Others are just like, I need a lesson for structure. Um, and they're not going to be really progressing at this point. So it's been kind of my goal to see where they're doing or where they're at in that and, you know, best help them through this because I mm -hmm. am someone there for them. And that's really what my purpose was going on forward with teaching over Zoom. So, yeah. Yeah, for me personally, I, I don't have the amount of students um, for my private lessons that you do. But I have actually before this, I have experienced teaching online lessons. I would do that for makeup lessons once in a while. And I think it is a really valuable tool, like how yeah. we're connecting right now. Um, it's so amazing how we can connect over technology in this way. And you know, still learn, still interact. Um, it is different though. One thing I noticed when I initially started teaching online lessons is especially with my younger students, there's so much um, in person that I'm able to do with a student regarding their posture and just, you know, fine tuning, like move your elbow a little bit this way or, you know, kind of helping them to place their finger exactly where it needs to be. And I think that's still such an important aspect of teaching any instrument. You, I think in person is definitely, there are so many benefits to teaching in person for instrument, instrumental music. But as you were saying, over Zoom, over online video lessons, I am able to go more in depth on stretching how I can explain how I want them to <laughs> adjust <verbal>. something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I have also, I've had to get better explaining yeah. verbally what I want rather than just in person. Yeah. Move that there. And then being able yeah. to kind of like show them on the instrument where it is. So that has been good to stretch me in that way too. Oh yeah, for sure. And obviously, you know, you miss seeing them in person and it's not the same. Um, but I think everyone's trying to do their best to make it you know, as close as possible for until we can meet again. Yeah. Okay. My next question for you is at Bowling Green State, you were an assistant for the string quartet there. And can you describe a little bit more to our viewers who might not know about what that was like, what that was, and your favorite part of being in that whole experience in that, at that program? Yeah. So it's a two-year program. And it, we're basically on stipend, that's our assistantship. So we rehearse eight hours a week and then we have a two hour coaching. So two hours every day, essentially. Um, and we put together two programs uh, or we, two recitals, um, usually of the same program, sometimes it's a little different. And each semester, so we have a full program each, each semester that we're working towards. Um, through that, we also play in the community. We do kind of workshops with some schools. We're trying to do that a little bit more. Um, we also do area seminar and other school events. So there's a lot of performing opportunities. And alongside. Oh, no, it timed out on me. Oh, no. 
I think you're loading. Can you still hear me? Yes, you're good. Cool. Okay. You, you um, on at least on my screen, the joys of technology. You like totally froze, and I was like, <laughs> "Is it better okay. now?" Yeah, it's better. Okay. So we are also principals um, of the orchestra, and that allows us to lead sectionals and kind of connect a little bit more with the, the undergrads um, who are in our, our sections. Um, so that's kind of our job description per se. Uh, my favorite thing about the quartet, I think it's just been having more time to experiment and to dive deeper. Um, in undergrad, we only had you know a rehearsal once or twice a week, right? It wasn't mm -hmm. a full-time commitment thing. And I've learned really a lot about um, just how to score study, how to listen, how to dive more in depth. And it's also been really good to learn how to facilitate, um, but also, you know, step down and listen to others um, and respect their opinion. Even if you don't think it's good, you're going to try it, right? Because you want this for the greater good. You're all coming together to create this piece of art. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's really special. I think we, especially in my quartet that I've had, everyone has been phenomenal. And I cannot thank them enough for <laughs> everything that they've, you know, walked me through and helped me with. And it's been really exciting just to hear everyone's, you know, everybody has a different life. Everybody has different experiences. Um, you know, we can kind of build off of each other's weaknesses and make them stronger together. And I think just seeing that unfold for the two, or the two years that we've had has been really special. Um, and I've learned so much from it. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And I also think we have, so we have different coaches every semester and it's been really exciting just to see what they focus on and how they coach us because each one is different, obviously. Um, so just to learn from them in that respect of how, what they're looking for, what they're specializing in, you know, all the that stuff to make us better. So that'd probably be my favorite part of it. Mm -hmm. So I just answered a question and I'm figuring out, trying to figure out how to lower my um, keyboard and it's not doing it on my iPad. Do you have any tips, Madeline? I do not. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, I figured it out. We're learning so much on this first session. It's great. I know. I've never done this before. <laughs> I have not either. This is super exciting. Um, so we have so many people who are on with us live right now. And then also you and I received a few questions from people. So I want to dive into those now. One of the questions we got was from my friend Aaron. And I'm kind of summarizing what he asked. But he, he asked, one of you studied arts administration for your master's and the other studied violin performance how has having or not having the other degree made each of you feel and you and I kind of talked about this mm -hmm. um I kind of wanted to touch on what I feel first so sure. for you Madeline you have just kind of like what you were just describing with working with your string quartet you just gone into so much detail and you're able to work with your quartet on nuanced you know, melodic lines or how you're communicating a piece. And I think in undergrad, yes, I was in string quartets and I studied violin performance, but I was more focused on learning techniques for myself personally, how I can, you know, be a solo musician. And yes, I played in ensembles, but the extent that you practiced, you said like what, 10 hours a week? Yeah. This that's a lot together that's not so, separate <laughs> yeah so I feel like with because I don't have that experience that you have I feel like you are just so much more nuanced with your capabilities of performing your violin in ensembles than I am um and with your your studies and how much time you spent coaching and being a principal player and needing to do sectionals with your group, you have more experience working in those types of settings, communicating about what you want musically to happen than I do. Yeah. I would, I mean, yeah, I would agree with that. Um, I think the, the biggest thing that I worked on in my master's was just, collaboration and getting to a level where you can do that professionally. Um, again, in undergrad, we worked, I think, more as an individual soloist. Um, 
and you're still working on that in your master's, but there's just so many more opportunities for collaboration. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the arts management, I, you know, I don't know anything about running a nonprofit <laughs> like Clarissa does or any of the management that she does with the symphony as, uh, you know, that extent of the background, I guess. I don't know much about that at all. Um, we don't really cover that. The closest thing I, I kind of know about that is I've just been a music assistant for uh, an opera company. And so I kind of see a little bit what's going on in the, in the, you know, backstage, but I don't really have a good concept of everything and how to run that. So I think arts, ma arts management really focuses on, you know, everything but playing. And I have basically just focused on playing <laughs> mm -hmm. in my master's. Yeah. So. And I would say we're both skilled in, you know, you're very skilled in management as well in different ways. Yes. And I'm, I'm skilled in playing the violin, but we haven't stepped to that next level in each other's areas of, um, what would you call it? When you take an area in your study and you... <laughs> next degree of... <laughs> I had a word for it and it totally slipped out of my mind. <laughs> your emphasis, yeah. your, yeah, your yeah. emphasis yeah. of your study. Yeah, we haven't focused on that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So for my arts management, arts administration stuff, most of my studies were based on how to properly run a nonprofit 501c3 expertise. Sarah, put the word in. Thanks, Sarah. You're awesome. Expertise. There we go. I've been in quarantine for too long. <laughs> I don't have experience talking anymore. Um, was it, what was I saying? Most of my master's degree focused on nonprofit 501c3 organization, how you run those financially, how you, you know, I spent a lot of time learning about the form 990s for the taxes that we have to do and how to work with marketing plans, fundraising plans, how you properly elicit funds from donors. So there's a lot of like, nitty gritty details in management that I stepped into in my master's program. Right. Yeah. And we don't even touch on that. <laughs> in yeah. The performance program. So yeah, it's quite different actually. Yeah. But Clarissa, we need all of us. Question. Yeah. What's your <laughs> I have a question for you. Um, so what is your favorite part about being the operations coordinator for the Grand Rapids Symphony? That's a great question. Um, I love my job because it is so much variation. I get to do so many different things at the symphony. I work in the office on a lot of administrative, like paperwork, making sure details of events go smoothly. I, t I contact a lot of vendors. I work with the production team specifically, just making sure projects move forward. So it's kind of like project management. I'm assisting my team with details of events and it's also kind of like event planning like there are so many things that go into the hundreds of concerts the Grand Rapids Symphony puts on every year and I'm someone who assists in helping those details move forward so I have to work with that stuff but then on top of that outside of the office I get to be like on the ground at events so working at DeVos Hall working backstage. I also have to work with stagehands and communicate with musicians, communicate with guest artists. And I also manage one of the education programs at the symphony called the Mosaic Scholar Program, which provides free lessons to at-risk African-American and Latinx students. So it's a huge variety of things that I get to be involved in. And again, going back to what we were talking about earlier, I think it's just so exciting in the arts, I think many times, like you were saying, Madeline, we have to be kind of entrepreneurs and we have to be able to have a little bit of skill in so many different areas. Mm -hmm. And I find that exciting. Yeah, for sure. It's really <laughs> I wouldn't have it anyway, anywhere else. Really. Yeah, yeah. And then, okay. So next question from our audience. Someone okay. asked both of us what our biggest fears are. And I'm, I'm assuming that's related to career. So I'll let you answer that first. 
Okay, so I think my biggest fear um, was really just making the step to go to school for music. Um, there's just such a stigma of you can't go into the arts and you can't have a living if you do so. Um, so I was really afraid that making that step to go to undergrad for music was going to kill the rest of my life and the rest of my career. I, I really kind of embodied all of that stigma and I felt like I could only do it for four years and it would be done. Um, and obviously that has changed a lot. I, I honestly, I've had like a really successful gap year, um, even in between there without really being connected too much. So I think honestly, you just need to put yourself out there and you need to go after it and, you know, make a way for yourself. Again, you're creating your own business essentially um, in the music industry. And yes, you'll probably have times where you're not going to be making as much money as you could be. But I think if you're doing what you're, you love, then what does it matter, right? Um, so I, yeah, I think my biggest fear was in that transi transition to making it a career choice and being afraid that I wouldn't be able to do so. So mm -hmm. yeah, what is yours? <laughs> yeah. Um I, I definitely had some of the same fears, actually, as you. So actually, when I started at Hope, I was trying to double major in biology and music because of the same kind of fears in the back of my mind. Like, is music something that's going to be able to sustain me as a full-time career in the future? But again, like you said, it was the only thing I was passionate about. And I wasn't really passionate about biology. I couldn't really... I still love things about biology. I think it's super interesting, but I couldn't imagine myself stepping into that full time. So that was one of my fears. Another fear that I've had to really overcome in the industry, I think, is just solo performing. I used to get so scared of stepping out onto a stage alone and the stage fright. And just for me, I think you and I were talking about this actually last night. Um, I, there was once, once in college where I messed something up in a piece of music and I ran off the stage and I started crying and it was just like a terrifying moment. But I think, you know, I've overcome a lot of my fear in that just by doing it more. It's kind of like public speaking. Um, sometimes when you're in maybe elementary school, you have to give a presentation. Were you ever nervous about that? I don't, I think I started becoming nervous um, more like even in my master's degree all of a sudden. I think I, it was just a le another level of performing, right? That you have to overcome. Yeah. And so I think I was, I was really strong in high school <laughs> and then everything else kind of. <laughs> yeah. Maybe, maybe it's just me. Out. I think, I think yeah, I was maybe. a very, <laughs> I was a very shy person uh, when I was younger. And I think music for me is something that I feel so passionate about and when I play a piece, it's almost like it's coming from my soul. Like I really feel it. It's something that I'm really connected to. And when I stood up, used to stand up on a stage, it almost was like exposing my soul to everyone who was watching. And if I mess something up, it was a direct reflection of my worth. So I've really had to overcome that. And I yeah. think that the only reason I've been able to overcome it is to just continue to practice it, go out on stage, you know, push myself out of my comfort zone. And I think that there is so much benefit from doing that. Yeah, like you said, I mean, music was something from, I mean, since I was like four years old that I've just seen the powerful effects that it can have on a wide array of audience. And I just, I needed to be a part of that, I think, throughout my entire life. So there's really nothing else that I wanted to do. And I just had to make it happen. So yeah. Yeah. All right. So next question, which is okay. totally opposite than every other question we've gotten from our audience, Madeline. This one was about fashion. Someone Ooh, okay. asked us if we like fashion. And I actually wanted to answer this question because I think it is very applicable to being a musician. And mm -hmm. I love fashion. I love, I think fashion is another art form. It's a way of not only being functional with how we dress and what we're doing, what, you know, playing the violin, there are certain pieces of clothing that I wouldn't wear because it's just like the way you put it on your body. I wouldn't wear very heavy fabric. 
And there've definitely been times where I, I didn't decide to wear a certain dress because of the way it fit on me and where the violin sits. So I think the function and the expression of fashion is something that I definitely take into consideration when I'm performing. And I won't, you know, wear something if it's going to make me feel uncomfortable because I think musicians too, it's almost, you know, it's, it's a sport. Like it's like a ballerina is not going to wear, you know, a basketball outfit to like do a dance because their body moves in a certain way and they need to express themselves in a certain way. I think the same thing for violinists specifically, like if you gave a solo performance, you want to look beautiful. At least I do. I want to look beautiful. And I also want to express, you know, a level of elegance on the stage, but I also want it to be functional. Mm -hmm. And another thing about fashion that we could talk about is how in orchestra, um, the standard, you know, uniform is all black attire so like 70 percent of my closet is black what would you say <laughs> i would probably agree yes <laughs> yeah um to me i think i you know i'm i'm looking at it more in the um, practical sense so if you're in a large group obviously you want to look your best in black but also you're not going to distract you don't want to be the focus right um, and your purpose in that ensemble is to connect with everyone else and to portray your mm -hmm. music to the audience. So if doing that, if you're, you know, wearing um, any things with any sort of flashiness or craziness, like you're going to take away from that. Mm -hmm. um, for solo performing, obviously, you have a lot more uh, leeway with what you wear. Um, but again, it needs to be practical. It needs to be what you need. Like I have a problem with strapless dresses just because of my shoulder rests. Um, but I think you also need to think about why well, I think it's fun to think about, um, what your program is kind of, what color is your program? You know, if you're playing a really flashy or you know, flashy piece, like you probably want to try and wear red or, you know, you want to kind of add to the music in that sense. Um, I don't think you want to take away from the music in that sense. Mm -hmm. So if you can, I think you should kind of program your, your tire towards your music. Um, but you also don't want to <laughs> take away from your performance by wearing something that's, you know, too extravagant, <laughs> um, which yeah. I guess vocalists get a little bit more leeway in that than we do, but because they have to fit the character more, but yeah, yeah. something to think about. Yeah, that was really well said. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, the last question that we got is what is or has been the favorite, a favorite project that you have worked on? Ooh. Um, project. I don't I mean, I would probably say this kind of goes back to grad quartet, but honestly, I think that the, over the two years of the grad quartet, that's probably my most fun and most in-depth project that I've had. Um, and I know it's kind of, you know, it's part of my job, but I've really enjoyed working on that. And it will be said, and we, our final recital is supposed to be tomorrow, I think. Um, and it will be said not having that opportunity. So we've worked so hard in the beginning of the semester. Um, but I think that's probably up to date, the the biggest and best project I've worked on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about you? <laughs> um, for me, I think I have a few, but one that really sticks out to me and something that I never thought I would have been involved in was going with the Grand Rapids Symphony to Carnegie Hall. Um, we we traveled there two years ago, and I was able to assist with just the planning and the travel logistics and the working with the hall and the guest um, musicians and kind of like being on the tour bus while we were in New York City and just helping everyone with the back backstage behind the scenes 
work that went into putting a huge performance on in one of the most prestigious halls in the world and not just the yeah. United States. And that was just such a, an impactful moment for me. Um, as someone who's kind of young in my career, it was just really a wonderful experience. And I'm so thankful to have had that already. And, um, and then, so that would probably be my favorite project that I've worked on. And then being involved also with the Mosaic Scholar Program at the Symphony has been really fruitful to just work with so many young students um, and see how they grow and see how music positively impacts their lives, not just because it's beautiful, but how it connects them with people around them and their communities and how they grow into themselves um, to become yeah. adults and have opinions about many things, not, not just related to music, but an array of things. And it gives them confidence to step into their futures as well, I think. So that's been yes. really fun too. For sure. Yeah. Cool. So that was our Q&A. Does anyone else who's watching live have any questions they want to type into the comment box? Otherwise, do you have any parting words, Madeline? Um, I would just say really try to make the most out of this time that we have a little bit more free time. Um, I know it's difficult sometimes to find motivation, but I think as artists, this is a, a moment of rest for us where we're not running around constantly. 